Hi guys, this is gsno.com and I'm here with a review of the long-awaited Samsung Galaxy Z Flip 3 5G. So we're dealing with a foldable phone, as you probably know already, it has an expanded external cover screen and a few other novelties, including a sturdier metal frame. The device was unveiled quite recently on August 11th and should be priced at around $999, making it one of the most affordable new phones out there. It's got a dual back camera, it's got a cream color here, but there are quite a few other colors to choose from, including black, green, uh, violet and a few more. Now, let's talk about the design first and foremost. So, we got plastic protection at the front for the screen you're seeing here, which is a 6.7 incher, while uh, at, the, at the back side we should be able to find Victus glass for the protection. And we're dealing with a special aluminum frame, uh, which uh, is made of armor aluminum, supposedly more resilient than the previous Z Flip models. The handset is now slimmer at 6.9 mm compared to the predecessor 7.2 mm and weighs about the same, which is 183 grams. It has IPX8 certification, which is something new for foldables because it makes it water resistant, at the same time not quite dust resistant. The frame and hinge are supposed to be more resilient, that's how the device closes up, that's how it opens up, and as you can see there's still a bit of a crease here, which is pretty visible, I would say just as visible as it was on the uh, predecessor. Now I think it's time to talk about the screen. Uh, I would also want to mention that the phone is pretty comfy as far as the button control is concerned, as far as gripping it is concerned, holding it and using it, and especially it's very pocketable once you close it up. Now, the whole screen aspect, the main one is a 6.7 inch foldable dynamic AMOLED with a resolution of 2640 over 1080 pixels and this time with 120 hertz refresh rate. The external one, the cover screen, is a 1.9 inch panel and this one has actually grown from the predecessor's 1.1 inch. So 1.9 inch Super AMOLED with a minor resolution of 512 over 260 pixels. Now, of course we're going to put the screen panel to the test and I'm talking about the main one which is the one that plays videos and we have a video for that purpose here. Okay, so this is what the media playback looks like on the screen. And this one is a full HD content with HDR. I would say it's pretty immersive, vividly colored, and the screen is quite bright. We have uh, pretty wide view angles. And the experience is satisfying, even though you cannot help but notice the crease in the middle at some angles. Okay, so that's about it as far as the display is concerned. We also have some measurements here to show you. Now, this uh, main panel here, which is a bit too bright at the moment, let's turn it down a bit. Okay, so this panel here is able to achieve a level of 458 lux units according to our measurements, which means uh, it's able to surpass the Z Flip 442 lux units and uh, at the same time it scores below the Motorola Razr 5G and the Huawei Mate XS, but not by a huge amount. So I would say it's a decent level of brightness for a foldable phone of this size. You have quite a few settings to go through if you're talking about the screen. You have your dark mode settings, adaptive brightness, uh, motion smoothness with the refresh rate, screen modes with colors and advanced settings, and a lot more, including touch sensitivity, for example. And of course, always on display, which also applies to the cover screen, by the way. Now, uh, speaking of the cover screen, you have it here, and if you double press the power button, you can trigger the camera and use the main camera as a selfie camera by seeing your face here. Now, other than that, you can use this cover screen to navigate between your notifications, music, weather, schedule, alarms, health, voice recorder, timer, and so forth. You can actually choose these ones from the settings. Uh, we have other shortcuts. You can see the notifications here. From what I know, you should be able to access this area and you should also activate Samsung Pay with a swipe. That's basically its core purpose, everything I showed you so far. Moving further, I think we go to the inside of the phone and we're going to use this app here to show you that we have a Qualcomm Snapdragon 888 processor. 
it's accompanied by 8 gigs of RAM and 128 gigabytes of storage, even though there are also other versions of the phone with uh, double the amount of storage. The processor is a pretty famous one, you've seen it on quite a few smartphones this year, the Snapdragon 888, and uh, we don't have any sort of lag on this handset. Uh, but I've noticed that there's a bit of heat in the top part of the phone, particularly after longer periods of intense usage. When I say heat, I mean more heat than the Galaxy Z Fold 3, which I'm also testing these days. Now, when it comes to benchmarks, we have them here as well, and they're not exactly impressive. I mean, we're placed on the 23rd spot in Antutu 8, barely surpassing Poco F3 and Motorola H+, Plus, uh, while staying below the Galaxy Z Fold 2 and the Moto G100, for example. When it comes to Geekbench 5, multi-core, just above Huawei Mate 40 Pro, at the same time below the OnePlus 8. When it comes to 3D Mark for the gaming aspect of things, or on the 45th spot above the Huawei Mate 40 Pro, Galaxy S20 and Motorola H20, but below the uh, Huawei P40 Pro to name just one model. So it's not exactly top 10 material, possibly on account of the resolution, who knows. Anyway, uh, the performance should be enough for a few years of future proof running and three versions of Android with no problem. As far as the temperature is concerned, the actual results we measured weren't bad. I mean, we got up to 34.9 degrees Celsius in benchmarks. But in reality, as I said before, after intense usage and especially photo taking in the sun, this top part will get a bit hotter in this area here. Hotter than the Z Fold 3. Now, on the battery front, we have a 3300 mAh unit just like the predecessor, with 15 watt wire charging, 10 watt wireless charging, and also reverse wireless charging. These are the battery tests. We start with the video playback. We achieved 12 hours and 23 minutes of continuous HD video playback. I mean, it's decent. It's uh, pretty much on par with the Galaxy S20 Ultra, but I expected a bit better. It's also superior to the Moto Razr 5G foldable phone. Okay, so continuing with this result here for the video playback, um, we were able to surpass the uh, first Galaxy Fold, as you can see here, and at the same time we stayed below the Galaxy Z Flip, the predecessor, the first one, not the 5G one, by two hours, so that was superior, and this result is actually the exact perfect equal with the Galaxy Note 20 Ultra. When it comes to continuous usage, we have PC Mark here, and in PC Mark we achieved a modest 8 hours and 16 minutes, which is a rather modest, uh, it's placed on the 240th spot in all of our tests. The first Z Flip was superior by 3 hours and that's all you need to know. The refresh rate is taking a toll on the battery life of the phone. It requires 1 hour and 46 minutes to juice up fully and after 30 minutes it reaches 34% charging, should have been faster. On the acoustics front, you can see here the bottom speaker. We don't have an audio jack and we don't have a top speaker we're relying on this three-hole earpiece to complete the experience. And the experience goes something like this. Okay, so I feel it could have been louder, for sure. I would say that there's a decent amount of bass and high notes, no distortion, but the top speaker is definitely not as powerful as the bottom speaker. Of course, we also have measurements to show you, we did our usual tests, and when it comes to volume power, we achieved 84.7 decibels for the bottom speaker with a typical acoustic sample, and 80, just 80 decibels with the top one. So definitely not very impressive. It's below the Z Flip from before this model. When it comes to gaming, 89.7 decibels, once again unimpressive. It's below the Z Flip again, and I wanted more decibels from this phone, even though uh, Samsung may have thought of its structural integrity and the vibrations. Who knows? Now on the camera front, not much has changed from the predecessor. We have a 10 megapixel camera here with fixed focus for your selfies. It's the same one from the Galaxy S10 series from what I've heard. And a dual back camera, 12 megapixel each sensor, optical limit stabilization for the main one, ultra wide lens for the second one, and that's about it. 4K 60 frames, filming for the back camera. And from what I remember, surprisingly enough, for the front camera, let's see if I'm correct, so video. And guess what? 
full HD 60 frames per second, even though some other websites list it as merely 30 frames. Okay, so for a pretty obvious reasons, I will not insist too much on the photos taken with this phone, simply for the fact that um, they're at about the level of a 2019 phone. That's the vibe I'm getting. I mean, they're not bad, but they could have been better, if I'm being really honest. The good thing about the camera is that there's not a huge difference in color calibration from the main camera to the ultra wide one, so that's nice. But the colors are a bit intense, the dynamic range is a bit limited, and uh, the focus can be hit and miss sometimes in close-ups. We don't have a zoom camera, so we're only set with digital zoom, which I would say does a decent job, but since we don't have a telephoto camera. I remember being disappointed by the Galaxy Z Flip selfie camera, which seems to have been a bit improved on this device's uh, selfie shooter, even though on paper should be the same camera, something has changed because I'm actually happier with the results here. And especially the bokeh, I feel it has evolved a bit. We also have those cool effects which came with the Galaxy S21 series and you can see them here. Okay, so even more colors here and details. Once again, the ultra wide camera doesn't change the color, so that's nice, but they're a bit too intense for my own liking. And that's it for the daytime. It feels like a 2019 phone, at the best, like the Galaxy Note 10. During the nighttime, we have those elongated lines for the light sources. If it weren't for the light sources, the pictures would be decent. We have poor ultra wide shots for a flagship, if you consider this a flagship. In general, it behaves more like a sort of um, high mid-range phone during the night time. And uh, at least the quantity of light we captured is, I would say, pretty decent. Okay, so that's it on the photo front. Feels like a 2019 phone. And um, let's uh, now check out some videos. We have uh, 12 of those. And the most relevant one is this one. The optical image stabilization is quite fine. And this is a video without it. So one thing you can be sure of is that you're going to film in 4K with a lot of details and with good stabilization, also some pretty intense colors. The, uh, focal, the focus test was also quite solid, changing focus here pretty fast in an efficient manner. And we also have some uh, colors here. and a bit of selfie action, not as well stabilized as the ones before. And if you want nighttime shots, that's what you're getting. More like a mid-range affair. So keep in mind that uh, what you're getting here is about, I would say, the same experience as the Galaxy Note 10 from two years ago. That's about it. On the connectivity front, this is a 5G phone with Wi-Fi 6, with Bluetooth 5.1, with USB-C 3.1, with NFC and GPS. It has all the bells and whistles, Galileo, Beidou and so forth. And it has a pretty okay volume and clarity when it comes to your calls. When it comes to speed test, we did uh, quite a few tests, as you can see here. We tried to catch some 5G, didn't quite make it. And uh, we achieved up to 780 mega per second downloads on Wi-Fi, which is crazy, and 859 mega per second in uploads. On 4G, up to 180 over 50, uh, excuse me, uh, 64.7, that's what we got for the 4G, which is actually not that bad. When it comes to the software, that's probably the most important part. That's because you're going to test the whole flex thing of the phone. You're wondering why am I going to flex this device? Well, for one thing, you can split the experience. I mean, for the top part, you're going to see the content. For the bottom part, you have the interaction. Uh, this is useful for YouTube. So if I'm watching a video here or listening to a clip and I want to write a comment, I can continue enjoying the content while also writing. That's the whole idea of splitting the experience. And speaking of splitting, you have the multitasking option here. You can have a gallery on the one hand and you can have YouTube on the other hand and enjoy your content while you're watching photos. And also you can write an email while you're, I don't know, chatting with someone. And that's just one example of the things you can do here with multitasking. This also happens for the camera interface, which has been split right now between this area and this area, the options and the viewfinder. You can also move them around and we can also resort to the cover screen for the preview to aid you with your needs and that's pretty much it 
that's the core of the split and flex experience there are several more apps which allow you to do this and also this whole thing this whole angle thing helps you better with taking shots from weird angles when you're a tourist abroad now when it comes to security i have set up the fingerprint scanner here in this power button and as you can see it's pretty fast we also have always on display with a beautiful butterfly gif this is One UI 3.1.1, which I have applied on top of Android 11. I'm using this free aggregator. There's also the one from Google. And uh, let's see what else. We have the quick settings area, which now takes up the whole screen. We have the media and devices section. We have the more, the better separated settings options and quite a few of them. Biometrics, privacy, advanced features, and so much more. Digital well-being, software update, and other useful stuff. Okay, so this is basically 100% of the Galaxy S21 experience when it comes to the software plus, plus though, those flex extras. So flex in YouTube, flex in the camera, flex in the browser for the keyboard and flex also in the gallery. Uh, you should be able to use that area. So we have the touchpad here for the navigation and the options related to the apps. This should make photo editing quite easy and nice. Now, if you want to have a look here we have the edge panel which we've known for a while now and if you keep press the home button excuse me the power button you have bixby to give your commands to uh, we also go here for your always on display options which will also be applied to the cover screen just so you know and one thing that's missing here uh, as you can see we have link to windows but we don't have dex available on this model so maybe that's something we can receive with an update we have quick share, we have a dark mode, we have Wi-Fi calling and a few more, but no trace of that. I would say that's about it as far as the review is concerned. I know that some of you may say that uh, we didn't exactly insist too much on the whole, you know, camera thing. This is not a camera centric phone for sure. I mean, it has the camera, but it's not on par with the flagships, even though it has a flagship price of about $1,000. So there's that. It's time for the pros and cons. It's the end of the review. On the pro side, we have a better price than before for a foldable, one of the best prices. Pretty good optical instabilization when you're filming. Uh, at the same time, uh, the selfie camera seems like it has evolved a bit from the predecessor. We have quality screens all around, the main one and even the external one, which has increased in size. What's weird for me is that you're forced to use it like this. I mean, like this. You cannot use it in this orientation, which is a bit baffling for me. Anyway, getting back to the pros, it's very comfy, pocketable, well-built, and it has fast connectivity. One UI 3.1 can easily sell the phone by itself. It now has IP60, excuse me, IPX8 certification. It's pretty future-proof as far as the software and processor are concerned. And those are the pros. Now on the cons, it charges slowly. Uh, the benchmarks weren't pretty impressive. Also, the cameras feel like a 2019 iteration. The speakers were so-so. There's no microSD. And the battery was overall underwhelming. That's about it. This one is a fashion statement. I feel like it's more for the ladies and the trendsetters. Uh, if you want to focus more on the camera, you may want some other model. Maybe a bigger one. If you want to focus on the screens and consuming media, this may be it for you. But for media creation, you may require more. I'm actually happier with the way you capture video here uh, compared to the way you capture photos with it. In the end, it's a good looking phone, which is pocketable. It's a fashion statement. It's trendy enough to get people to buy it. And you have quite a few color choices this time around. So that's about it. Remember what I said about the camera when deciding to purchase the phone or not. It's your decision. Bye bye.